everybody, my name is Ellery and I'm part of the students team here at Covenant. We are so glad that you decided to stop by our YouTube channel today. If you are new here, text the word new to the number on the screen and we would love to get to know you and send you a gift. And now let's jump into our teaching time. Thanks for joining us today. So over this month of November, we're going to look at four really strategic passages of scripture and they all have to do with fishing. Okay, I know some of you are big fishermen, fisherwomen, and uh, the, all of these, there's a lot of fishing in the Bible, have you noticed that? So all of these have fishing in them, and today's account from the book of Luke will be familiar to many of you. For some of you, this, it'll be a brand new passage of scripture that you've, you've never studied or you've never read before. It's okay. I just want to start by saying it is a great passage for us to look at today and I'm excited to be able to share it with you. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 5 today. So if you have your Bibles, you might turn to Luke chapter 5. If not, turn with me in your notes page because we're going to follow along and read it together. All right, before we do, before we explore Luke chapter 5, I think it would be helpful to go back into the fourth chapter of Luke, because what we see in Luke chapter 4 is the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. And I know we kind of take it for granted a lot of times, but it's in the book of Luke that we actually find out that Jesus was 30 years old when he began to reveal himself. And he began to talk about his mission and why God the Father had sent him and what he was supposed to be doing. And so... The first thing that we see in Luke chapter 4 is Jesus entering the Jewish synagogue on a Sabbath day. This is in the town of Capernaum, and this would be like, for us, coming to church on Sunday morning. Okay, it would, it would be, this is what Jewish people did on the Sabbath day, they went to the Sabbath service. And so everybody's gathered there in that town, in this particular synagogue. And Luke tells us that that day, there was a man there who was possessed by a demon at church. And you might say, why would a demon-possessed man go to church? Well, if you know you've got a problem... And you know that thing, you're struggling and that you need some help from God. Where would you go? But to God's house. And so this guy who is struggling in, just think about interior struggle. Man's, man's got uh, demonic things going on in his life. He comes in to the Sabbath service there in the synagogue. And Luke doesn't tell us whether... This happened at the beginning or in the middle or at the end of the service. But it just says, at some point, the man starts to yell. All right, nothing messes up a sermon more than a demon-possessed person standing up yelling. Okay? Right? So I don't know if that's what was happening. The rabbi was teaching. But this guy starts to yell. Not speak, but stands up and starts yelling. This is what he says. He says, Ha! <laughs> What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Now listen, sometimes we don't recognize the Spirit of God, but I'm going to tell you, the demons do every time. The demons, it says, not only do they know who Jesus is, they believe in Him, and they shudder. At his power and his authority. And so this, this demon speaks out of the man to Jesus. And Jesus, all right, this is all going on in church, okay? This is going on in synagogue service. Jesus stands and tells the demon to come out of that man. And it says that the demon got violent 
threw the man on the ground and then had no choice but to obey Jesus. And the demon came out. The man stood up and was all of a sudden was in his right mind and was free of the demon. And so, can you imagine being in the synagogue that day? You know, I, this is, I, just, I just imagine this. Beulah, did you see that? That man just, he just spoke to an evil spirit. And it obeyed him and he came out of this man. Have you ever seen anything like that? We've never seen anything like that in Capernaum. I certainly have never seen it in the synagogue. What kind of person is this who can command demons? And listen, now the Bible says, and I call this the, the perfect understatement. It says, and all the people were amazed. I mean, amazed just doesn't hit it, does it? And they were all amazed. Well, of course they were. You guess they are. <laughs> of course they were. Because that day, they saw something they'd never seen. And, and here's, the, here's the real amazing thing. It's the Sabbath day. Jewish people don't travel on the Sabbath day. They travel probably from their home to the synagogue and back. They, they, they stay at home. It's a day of rest. But the news didn't stay at home. The news, even on a Sabbath day, somehow traveled far and wide. And everybody heard about what had happened that day in the synagogue. All right? Second thing that happens in Luke chapter 4 is that after the synagogue service, Jesus is invited home to eat Sabbath day meal with a particular family. Now, we don't know if he had gotten the invitation earlier or whether after all of this went on, someone said, hey, could you come to my house? Now, the man who owned the house was named Simon, and he was a fisherman. Now, we know him as Peter. His name is Simon, nicknamed Peter. And his mother-in-law is sick. In fact, it says she has a fever. I, I think about it as, you know, she's, she's not just under the weather. It, apparently, she was delirious with fever. And they didn't know what to do. And so, Peter invites Jesus to come home and says, Oh, by the way, my mother-in-law is really sick. Is there anything that you could do for her? That's the question that they ask. So Jesus, and I guess they figure, right, if he can do something with that demon, surely he can do something with this fever. So Jesus goes over to his mother-in-law, and he speaks to the fever, and it leaves her. And she gets up, wipes the wrinkles, works the wrinkles out of her dress, and goes and starts fixing lunch. Now, I think in, on that day in that house, they're doing the same thing. Have you ever seen anything like this in your life? Now, someone who was there left the house because it says news, it's still the Sabbath day, news spread. This guy tossed a fever out of someone. He spoke and the fever left my mother-in-law. Now, this is how we know that the news spread. Because the third thing happens, Luke chapter 4. It says that as the Sabbath day was ending, and the, the Sabbath went from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. So as sundown happened, it's now okay for Jewish people to be free to move about. Because the Sabbath, the day of rest is over. Well, as soon as the sun went down, guess what? There are hundreds of people outside of Peter's house. Some of those people have inward demonic stuff going on. Some of those people have ailments. There are sick people who have all kinds of things. There are folks who are on crutches and on pallets. And they're hoping that Jesus will come out and help them. 
crowds of people, it says. And it says that Jesus started and went long into the night and touched and helped every single one of them. Now, all three of those things tell us something about Jesus. All three of those narratives tell us something about Jesus. Uh, they tell us that um, everywhere you look, there are people in need, and Jesus saw their need. Jesus never looked at people as burdens. He never looked at them as projects. He never looked at people as a bother to him. What we see is that Jesus regularly poured himself out for people and had great compassion on them because he knew people, these people were coming to him because they needed the power of God in their lives. And so they needed barriers broken. They needed chains snapped and released. They needed, they needed healing, physical healing of their bodies. And the thing about Jesus is as Jesus reached out and helped people with their physical needs, all of a sudden people would realize that they, their souls also had a need. And that not only did they need his help with their, their physical ailments, but they also began to be very anxious to hear what this man, Jesus, had to say. Because he spoke with authority they had never heard. It's like he had the words of God. Now that brings us to Luke chapter 5. This is how it begins. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, that is the Sea of Galilee, it's just another name for it, with people crowding around him listening to the Word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, and the one belonging, the one belonging to Simon... And asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. So people are crowding around Jesus. Some of them are probably there to have their physical needs met. Others are there because they want to hear what he has to say. And it's, it's hard to talk to a crowd when they're, they're crowding around you. And so Jesus sees two boats, they're flipped over because the fishermen are done for the day. And so he walks over and he speaks to one of the owners, who just happens to be Simon. He's been at Simon's house recently. And he says, can I borrow your boat? And Simon's like, sure. He says, hey, push, push me out into the lake just a little bit. So I think there are a couple of reasons he did that. One is so that the crowds wouldn't be pushing up against him. He'd put a little distance and he could speak to a larger crowd. Also, when you're out there on the water, your voice travels. So it was for acoustics. So there's a small amphitheater now and it says that Jesus sat in the boat and he taught the people. Now, after he was finished, he said to Simon, Hey, Simon, let's say we go out in the deep water and do a little fishing. Now, this is strange because, you see, Peter and his companions, his fishing partners, had already finished fishing for the day. Commercial fishermen, most of the time, they fished at night. They came in in the morning, they sold fish, they salted the rest of the fish so that they could sell those. And these men had already turned the, flipped the boats over, they had already washed their nets and taken all the, the seaweed out of them and they were done for the day. And 
Simon explains to Jesus why they were done. He says, listen, we fished all night. And we didn't catch a thing. Okay? Anybody ever been in that boat? <laughs> all right. We didn't catch it. We went out there. It's like the fish were avoiding us. He said, we didn't catch a thing all night. Fish, there are no fish out there. And Jesus says, well, what do you say we, we go fishing anyway? And I, I wonder if Peter just said, well, you did heal my mother-in-law. Or, well, you, you, you do have a lot of authority and I've appreciated your teaching. For whatever reason, he says, okay, because you say so, we'll get in the boat and we'll go and we'll put our nets back in the water. So this is the kind of fishing they're doing. They, they hook the net to the boat and they start dragging it through the water. And, and look what Luke tells us. When, when they had... Well, let me, let me hit this truth first because I skipped it. Um, you know, the, the, thing that we, the thing that we understand, and, and it is a truth that I don't want to miss, is the thing you understand from all these people on the, the shore is that they all want to hear what God has to say to them. People want to hear what God has to say. That's why all that crowd was there, right? That's why they were there. And, and it hasn't changed. People still want to hear what God has to say. Now, they may not come to church. They, they may not act like they're interested. But I'm just telling you, when things are going on in their lives, when, when, when they don't know what else to do, I'm just telling you, everybody prays looking up. Everybody's interested to know what God has to say to their personal experiences. And Jesus has the words of God. Right? So that's why they came to hear Jesus teach. All right, back to the story. So they're, they're, dragging, they're dragging the net, and it says, When they had done so, they caught such a number of, such a large number of fish that the nets began to break. So, so they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. Now, I'm just going to tell you, for me, I do not like to fish, but I do like to catch. This is the only way to fish, y'all. You go out there, and there's so many fish, you fill the boat and you can't hold them all, so you call the other guys and you fill that boat and the nets are breaking and you've never seen anything like this in your life. Okay, that's the way I want to fish. Fish, jump in the boat, <laughs> right? Now, this is, this is the greatest catch that any of these men have ever seen. They've never caught fish like this where the boats are sinking, which really brings me to the second truth, and it's, it's a simple truth. Jesus knows where all the fish are. That means, in our case, He knows where all the resources are. He knows where all the answers are. He knows where to look when we don't know where to look. Jesus knows where all the fish are. And so Jesus is in the boat with, with Simon. And Simon, think about it, Simon is sitting there in a boat that is almost sinking. It's full of fish and a couple of other guys and Jesus. And what Simon does is, I think, one of the most natural things in the world. It says, when, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said... Go away from me, Lord. I am a, I'm a sinful man. In other words, he says, Jesus, I've got nothing in common with you. I, I don't have... I'm a nothing. I don't have any faith. I'm not a very, I'm not a very religious man. I, 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 I mess up. All the time, here I am in the boat with you. You're a miracle worker. You're a healer. 
You, you can speak to demons and they leave. You, you speak the very words of God. We have nothing in common. You shouldn't have any more to do with the likes of me. I mean, I am a, I'm a failure. You, you don't know all the stuff that, that is in my past. You just need to, you need to move on from me. And I love Jesus' response to him. Because it's nothing like you think it would be. He says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Hey, Simon, don't be afraid. A lot of men wouldn't have gotten in the boat with me in the first place. A lot of them would have just laughed and they wouldn't be out here, but you're out here. Here, here you are, you're in the middle of the boat with all these fish because you had enough faith to get in the boat with me. He said, you know, a lot of men wouldn't have let me borrow their boat. They, they, they would have thought I was foolish, but you, you, you wanted to hear what I had to say in your life. You know, Peter, <laughs> listen, a lot of people would have moved away from me a long time ago, but you just keep drawing near to me because you understand the God-empowered authority that I have, that I can speak the words of God. And Peter, you seem to continue to want the words of God in your life. Peter, your heart is in the exact place I need it to be. Because you seem to always be ready to receive me. Then, then I envision him saying something like this. Hey, was this a good day? Did you enjoy this day? Peter's like, <laughs> well, this is the most amazing day of my life. I mean, I've, I've never experienced anything like this. He said, would you like to experience it every day? <laughs> You mean like catch fish like this every day? Like, you know, just, he said, it, was this thrilling to you, Simon? Yes, Lord, this has been a thrilling day. He goes, good. Well, then why don't you come follow me? Because from now on, we're not going to mess with fish. We're going to mess with people. We're going to bring in people. There are going to be more people just like you who need to hear the words of God, who want to draw near to me, people who have physical needs and spiritual needs, and you're going to help bring them to me. He says, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Now, it, it's, the following here is immediate. It says that they, as soon as they got on the shore, Jesus started walking. And they started following behind him. And that bothers some of you because you're worried about those fish. <laughs> what happened to those fish? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe Zebedee, the father of James and John, took care of the fish. Uh, maybe there were some other partners that they took care of the fish. This is the biggest haul ever. And they were like, those are just fish. Jesus is the one I want. And I'm going to follow him. And so it says they left their boats, they left their nets, they left all those fish. And they followed after Jesus. Now, where does that leave us in this story? Because it's a powerful story, but if it's just a story, then it means nothing. It's just a great story to read. You know, the, the reason to hear the Word of God is to move from a place of theory to a place of practice. It's when you move from it being a story about Simon and some fish in a boat to it being about the fact that just as Jesus called that man He's calling this man, and he's calling you. 
He's, he is making a miraculous call into my life and to yours. And this is the, the spiritual principle from this story. Is that real faith is when I go from believing it here to living it with my life. When it goes from being a story to being something that is real to me. And so I think there are two responses here in the form of questions. The first question is, what will it take for me to fall at Jesus' feet? Because that was the beginning part. You see, I believe that, that Peter believed in Jesus when he was at his house. I believe that he was listening to the words of God when he was washing his nets. But at some point, he ends up at the knees of Jesus. When Jesus says, now I want you to come and follow me. And it goes back to those two truths. Listen, every single person in this room has needs. We all have physical needs. We have spiritual needs. There's only one who can meet those needs. There's only one. And his name is Jesus. And he knows where the answers are. He's the only one that knows. He knows where to find what I'm looking for. And so Peter says, well, I know you have the words of God. I know who you are. You are so powerful and amazing, but I'm not very amazing. You don't know where I've been. And Jesus says, I don't care where you've been. I just want to know if you're willing to go from this point on. Will you come and follow me? Now think about this. Think about Peter. Peter ends up on his knees in front of Jesus. You know, that's really the only place for people like us. Is on our knees in front of the only one who can meet our needs. Because I've got a lot of needs. And every time I turn around i got more needs. Every time I look, there's more stuff that I cannot handle in my life. I've got inner struggles. I've got demonic stuff going on around me. I've got ailments. I've got spiritual battles. There's no one that can help me except Jesus. When I get to the place where I'm on my knees in front of Jesus, it's real. I wonder if that's where you would go. To your knees in front of the only one who can meet our needs. I wonder if there's someone here that you've said, I know who he is. Listen, don't be a demon. Ha! We know who you are. I know who he is too. He is the one and only risen Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one I can serve. Here I am, Lord. And I'm a sinner do you know where I've been? Yes, I know where you've been. And I don't care where you've been. I forgive you. Now follow me. That's where it's real, isn't it? When I've got, I'm, I'm at Jesus' knees. Well, you know, there's a second question. And the second question is a good question too. Well, once I, once I give my life, my allegiance to Jesus, what am I supposed to be doing? with the rest of my life. You know, when you bow before Jesus and He forgives your sin, that's called being saved. All right? And when you're saved, you have a promise that one day you're going to go to heaven. Okay? I'm counting on it, aren't you? All right, I'm counting on going to heaven. Well, what am I supposed to be doing between now, saved, and there, saved to the uttermost? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? Well, Jesus says, it has something to do with fishing. He says, I want you, I'm, I'm calling you to come along and help me in my mission. Because there are a lot of people just like you who have learned to fall at my knees 
they're, they're, you've learned to fall at my knees. They have not. They need you to introduce them, bring them, help them. I need, I need you to help me catch people. They're running hard. I need you to help me catch them. Now, our problem is we go, yeah, but I'm not a good speaker. I wouldn't know what to say. I'm not very good at catching people. I don't have to catch them. Because here's the two truths. People still want to hear from God. Everywhere you look, they want to hear from God. And you know what? I don't even have to know how to put the net in the water because Jesus knows where all the fish are. (laughs) I just have to have a net ready when he says, drop it right there. Let's go out in the deep water because I got some work for you to do. And you know what? According to this passage, there's nothing more thrilling in the whole world than fishing for people. The Lord, I want you to use us. Would you, as we get on our knees in front of you, would you use us to bring more people to yourself? You, you speak with authority and demons run and hide. You, you speak and you have the words of healing. And you can touch and, and you can move in powerful ways. You speak with authority. You have the very words of God. And we know it. And we're so grateful that you've called us to yourself. Now, would you use us to bring other people to yourself? And that is the kind of life that all of us are thrilled to live. We were saved to be able to do that. Would you raise us up to do this very thing in Jesus' name? Amen.